April 14, 1912. The dark night was filled with horrible sounds of a giant metal vessel breaking into two. The largest ship of that time collided with an iceberg that was on its way. The Titanic, one of the biggest stories of the 20th century that people still talk about. The starboard side of the giant vessel brushed up against the iceberg. It was 11.40 p.m. when things started going wrong. This iceberg caused enough damage for at least five watertight compartments in the hull to start filling with water. The crew immediately began a brief investigation to see if they could do anything and fix things. They had no one to rely on, all alone in the darkness of the cold night, far away from the land the North Atlantic Ocean, around 400 miles south of Newfoundland, Canada. They needed time to figure out how to bring people to safety. They had some time, true, but not enough. If you watched the movie, you know the ship didn't plunge immediately after the icy doom had happened. The whole process lasted a good 2 hours and 40 minutes. But the situation was hard. There were 2,200 people to take care of including crew and passengers, and things happening on the ship were chaotic. The chief designer, Thomas Andrews, soon realized they wouldn't be able to stay afloat. By midnight, the entire crew had begun preparing the lifeboats for launch. They had 20 boats with space for only 1,178 people, which was just a bit more than 50% of the people on board. The order was to get women and children to safety first. Crewmen were there to row and guide the boats. The scene over the next two hours gradually started escalating. The crew members had a task to wake up passengers and warn them something bad was happening. They wanted to place them into a fleet of lifeboats as soon as possible. At 12.15 a.m., some crew members sent out a distress signal. A steamship called Frankfurt was among the first ones that received the message and responded, but they were about 170 nautical miles away. Some other ships also got the message and offered their assistance, but sadly, they were too far away as well. At 12.20 a.m., the canard liner Carpathia got a distress signal from the Titanic and changed its course right away. They were 58 miles away at the time and it would take them more than three hours to get there. 20 minutes later, the crew was lowering the first lifeboat. It was carrying only 27 passengers, although it had room for 65. Many of the lifeboats that were launched first were well below capacity. Crew members were worried, thinking the Davids wouldn't be able to hold a fully loaded lifeboat. And in the beginning, Many passengers were just too afraid to leave the ship. They still thought Titanic was unsinkable and couldn't imagine the scenario that was going to happen one to two hours later. The crew was firing the first of eight distress rockets. Unsuccessful. No one was close enough to help. By 1.20 a.m., they lowered 10 lifeboats. Number 8 had only 28 people in it. One of the passengers on the number 10 was 9-week-old Melvina Dean. She would later become the last survivor who lived until 2009 and turned 97. It was 2 a.m. already. Three of the collapsible boats were the only lifeboats that remained on the ship. The bow of the vessel had sunk low and had tipped far under the surface. People around it could now clearly see stern propellers above the water. Crew members were lowering collapsible lifeboat D from the roof of the officers' quarters with over 20 passengers in it. As the ship's bow went under, the water was washing collapsible A from the deck. Those 20 people were struggling because their boat was partly filled with water. As crew members were trying to release collapsible B, it fell. Before they righted it, the water swept it off the ship. 30 passengers still managed to find safety on the overturned lifeboat. At 2.17 a.m., the ship's wireless operator decided to transmit one last distress call. A minute later, the light on the ship finally went out. Titanic and all left on board plunged into darkness. 
The bow continued to sink, and the stern was rising higher above the surface, which placed great strain on the midsection. Horrible sounds were filling the night. Titanic, this massive, legendary ship so many people placed their hopes in and were excited about, broke into two between the third and fourth funnels. Reports would speculate it took about six minutes for the bow section to reach the ocean bottom. The stern settled back in the water before it rose again into a vertical position. It remained in this situation until it finally disappeared into the ocean. At 2.20 a.m., the stern apparently retained air inside and water pressure crushed it as it went down. The stern landed about 2,000 feet away from the bow. People consider the Titanic the fastest ship in the world. They thought it was unsinkable because four of its compartments could be flooded and that still wouldn't cause a critical loss of buoyancy. Its life was problematic since its beginning. While the ship was leaving port, it moved within a couple of feet of the steamer New York. It managed to safely pass by, which was a huge relief for all those worried passengers massed on the ship's decks. Titanic sailed off on the 10th of April. Its first journey was across the highly competitive Atlantic route. On the launch day, the Titanic became the biggest movable object in the history of humankind. 882 feet long, 92 feet wide. Not that big if you compare it with today's ships. The biggest cruise ship in the world today is Royal Caribbean's Symphony of the Seas, which is roughly five times the size of Titanic. If you put that ship in a vertical position, it would be nearly as tall as the Empire State Building, which is 1,250 feet without antennas. But Titanic was a huge attraction back in its time. At one moment of their journey, they stopped in France, after which they made another stop in Ireland. Once the final passengers boarded, the massive ship set out at full speed for their final destination, New York City. Four days after the beginning of its journey, Titanic failed to divert its course from a huge iceberg, the story we all know about. Only 700 people survived and most of them were women and children. The night was extremely cold, one hour and 20 minutes after Titanic had gone down to the bottom of the ocean. Survivors weren't even sure someone was coming to save them. Finally, they saw the light. It was Carpathia coming towards them. They came for the people in the lifeboats. The crew brought them aboard and pulled a handful of other passengers out of the water. Many ships tried to contact Titanic a few hours after it sank. Their messages were never returned. Later, when there was an investigation of what really happened, they discovered the Leyland Liner California had been less than 20 miles away when Titanic was sinking. But the crew didn't hear the distress signals coming from Titanic because their radio operator was off-duty. Countries from both sides of the Atlantic were shocked and horrified when they heard details of what happened to Titanic. They decided to make changes to ship operations, rules that would help avoid such events in the future. They held the first international convention for safety of life at sea, where they adopted rules for every ship to have lifeboat space for each passenger on board. Also, lifeboat drills became mandatory. They also decided to establish an international ice patrol. Its main role was to monitor icebergs in the North Atlantic shipping lanes. Ships also needed to maintain a 24-hour radio watch. Titanic wasn't built alone. Because of the size of this magnificent ship and all the new equipment it required, it would have been too expensive as a one-off. So the team built the Titanic alongside two sister ships and both of them had eventful lifetimes. RMS Olympic came first. It was launched in 1910, and for a whole year was the biggest liner in the world. The Britannic was another sister ship that sailed for a while before it too ended down on the ocean bottom. 
But only Titanic became a legend and one of the most fascinating stories of modern history. We know Titanic from so many stories, even a movie. But now we have its first full-sized digital scan. And nope, it's not like those models from before, where we mostly imagined what the ship was supposed to be like. This time we got a real digital scan. A team of experts really mapped the deep sea floor around the Titanic together with the ship itself. We basically got a 3D view of the entire wreck, which is like going deep down beneath the ocean's surface and seeing Titanic as if all the water has been drained away. So, the story of the wreck started in 1985, 73 years after the Titanic went down. The explorer named Robert Ballard stumbled upon it somewhere between two submarines that also went down in that area. He was actually on a different task back then, so he didn't even have time to explore the ship properly. But as he was searching for the submarines, he realized how ocean currents affect sinking debris. He noticed the heaviest objects sank quickly and left a trail of debris behind, the trail that followed the currents. Using this knowledge, Ballard made a hypothesis the Titanic had broken in two and left a debris trail as it sank. Before he found the wreck, everyone thought the ship just went down in one piece after hitting an iceberg. So everyone knew where the ship was so the adventure could start, or not. It was hard to explore it. The ship is enormous, and the dark depths of the ocean make it really difficult to capture its whole body in one go. So we mostly relied on glimpses of the decaying ship and had to settle with teasing, scattered parts of the whole picture and filling it up with speculations and stories. But in the summer of 2022, we finally got something different. A team of experts from Magellan Loaded, a company specializing in mapping the deep sea, teamed up with Atlantic Productions, who were making a documentary about the project. They embarked on a mission to capture the complete view of the Titanic. They use submersibles. Those are vehicles that go underwater, remotely controlled by a team of skilled explorers. These submersibles dove deep into the ocean. It wasn't an easy job. They spent over 200 hours collecting information about the entire length and breadth of the wreck. It was like a real-life treasure hunt. But instead of finding gold and jewels, they took something even more precious. Over 700,000 images of the Titanic from every angle possible. Yup, they took photos of every tiny part of the ship. Even the not-so-interesting bits most of us would usually skip. Even mapping the muddy parts was an important part. Because it helped fill in the gaps between the more exciting things they discovered. And this was a way for all of us to finally get a detailed 3D reconstruction. Even though it's been more than 100 years you can still recognize the bow of the Titanic, covered in rust that hangs down like stalactites. On top of the bow is the boat deck, where a big hole gives us a glimpse into the empty space where the grand staircase once stood, like a window into the ship's glamorous past. Its stern is now a wild mess of twisted metal. As the Titanic went down, this part collapsed and spiraled into the seabed. The bow and the stern ended up separated by about 2,600 feet. There's a vast field of debris surrounding this giant, stuck on the seafloor. This debris is like a scattered treasure trove, full of intricate metalwork from the ship, statues, and even unopened champagne bottles. There are also personal belongings that went down together with the ship, like dozens of shoes resting across the seafloor. It was a tough task to do, go down and take all those pictures. It may not sound that hard at first, considering it was the vehicle that really immersed itself into such deep parts of the ocean, not the people. But studying the ocean is hard. We haven't explored, mapped, or even seen over 80% of it. The conditions are harsh, and the pressure becomes more intense the deeper you go. And their vehicle had to dive down to nearly 13,120 feet below the surface. That's like 12 Eiffel Towers stacked on top of each other. Plus, you have strong currents in that area, so it was probably like trying to navigate through a watery maze. And submersibles weren't supposed to touch anything. Even the slightest wrong step can damage the wreck that was already so fragile. It seems like the Titanic is frozen in time, so it will always be there waiting for us. But in reality, it's slowly disappearing. It's pretty obvious that the ocean water ruined it considering how long it has been down there. But it's not just that. The wreck itself has become a home for a specific type of Bacteria halomonas titanicae that even got named after the famous ship. These bacteria have a special ability. They can survive inside rusty formations known as rusticles. They kind of look like icicles, those spikes of ice that form when water falls from something and freezes. These bacteria have a taste for iron, which is abundant in the ship's hull, 
For them, it's like a real buffet down there. And as time goes by, these bacteria will keep eating away at the iron in the ship, bit by bit, until one day, the feast comes to an end, and the whole ship is gone. It's like a slow but steady recycling process. So this 3D model we got because of the hardworking team and technology comes at the best time because we never know how much time we have left with exploring the famous wreck. This time we might even understand the collision with the iceberg better. You know how movies always show the Titanic hitting the iceberg on its right side? Well, we can't even be certain about that. The scans could help us figure out if the ship actually grounded on the iceberg, like getting stuck on it. We can study the stern and analyze how the Titanic struck the seafloor. That will also help us understand what really happened during the sinking. Maybe we'll get a chance to discover if there was really a strong fire that sealed the fate of the Titanic. One theory says that the coal fire had been raging for whole three weeks before the ship even took its first and last trip. And this could have made its hull weaker, which means most of the work was done. The iceberg just delivered the final blow if there even was an iceberg, as some people wonder. There's an alternative theory they suggested where the Titanic may have actually hit a hidden mass of pack ice instead of a typical iceberg. Pack ice is made up of large sheets of ice that float near the ocean's surface and can be difficult to spot. They believe this pack ice might have drifted into the Atlantic from the Arctic Ocean. According to one professional mariner, Captain L.M. Collins, that stands up with that idea, if the Titanic had struck a regular iceberg, the ship would have sunk much more quickly than it did. And since the Titanic managed to stay on the surface for a relatively long period of time, less than three hours, maybe this was a different type of collision. The Mariner also said there are differences in what people said they saw when the Titanic sank. He thinks these differences might be because of optical illusions. In this case, when people were looking at the ocean that night, the way the light was reflecting and the conditions at sea might have made things appear closer or distorted. So when they saw something in the water, it might not have been exactly what they thought it was. Whether it was an iceberg or something else. Binoculars might have helped the crew members to spot the potential danger, but unfortunately, they didn't have any. It appears they were locked inside a cabinet and no one knew where the key was. Meet Arthur John Priest. No, he isn't famous for being a painter or for discovering some long-lost treasure. He didn't invent some cool gadget or break any world records. No, Arthur John Priest is famous simply for being unsinkable. Proving one can be both lucky and unlucky at the same time, Priest was involved in and survived several mishaps at sea, including the fateful maiden voyage of the Titanic. Priest was not a rich man interested in sailing for pleasure. He was part of the working class, employed as a stoker or fireman, stuck for hours within the hot bowels of large steam-powered vessels. His job was dirty and difficult. He was responsible for keeping the furnaces lit, feeding them coal to ensure enough steam was produced for the engines to work. He had to be careful about not overheating the system or setting fire to the whole ship. The furnaces had to be carefully watched and constantly fed. He breathed it all in a while working and fighting with the sweat and the dirt. He would often work shirtless because of the heat and was always covered in black coal dust. And when he finally had a break, his shared living quarters were nearby in the same part of the ship. He must have been good at his job though, because he had no trouble finding work. But wherever he went, bad luck seemed to follow. The first incident was a mild one. As a young man, Priest worked on the RMS Asturias, the passenger liner first set sail in 1907, traveling between Southampton in the UK to Buenos Aires in Argentina. At some point during its maiden voyage, the ship suffered a small collision. The damage was bad enough that the ship returned for repairs. Thankfully, there were no reports of any serious injuries. Priest, unfazed, simply went to work on another ship, but his bad luck lingered on the Asturias. In 1914, the Asturias became a hospital ship helping care for sick men and women around Europe while bringing them home to England. But in March 1917, at just around midnight, the ship was struck by a foreign object. Its hull was breached and the engine room flooded. The captain ordered everyone to abandon the ship, sending crew, patients, and health staff scrambling for the lifeboats. The vessel was still moving, 
powering through the water because the main controls, located within the flooded engine room, could not be turned off. The captain refused to leave the ship while people were still trying to escape. He was able to aim the Asturias towards Bolthead, where it finally hit land and couldn't sink. The remaining lifeboats were lowered and the final survivors made it to safety. When they studied the damage on the ship later, the Asturias was declared a total write-off. It might be hard to pin this particular disaster on Priest. After all, he wasn't even on the ship at the time. But it seemed that many of the ships on which he served were destined for trouble. His bad luck followed him to his next job on the RMS Olympic, a massive ocean liner. The Olympic was big. In fact, it had been designed and built as part of the fleet that included the Titanic. But with size came sacrifice. The Olympic was great at moving in one direction, but very difficult to handle when it needed to turn. It was September 1911. The Olympic was trying to alter its course. The Hawk, a smaller ship sailing nearby, didn't give the larger vessel enough room to maneuver, and the two slammed into each other. Because the Hawk was engineered to deal with potential confrontations when out at sea, its reinforced bow tore through the Olympic. Two large gashes appeared on the ocean liner's side. The propeller shaft was badly twisted, and worse, the ship began to take on water. Somehow, the Olympic made it to shore without sinking, and nobody was seriously hurt. Priest had no idea that this was just a small taste of what his future held for him. He next found employment on a brand new ship, a better ship, an unsinkable marvel that was said to be the biggest vessel to have ever been built. Yes, he was going to work on the Titanic. And what a job. It took 29 boilers, requiring 850 tons of coal a day, to produce enough steam to power the Titanic. Priest was just one of 150 stokers toiling away in the ship's underbelly, keeping those fires burning day and night. He made around $30 a month. But on April 14, 1912, he would find himself flung from a world of extreme heat to one of blistering cold. At approximately 11.35 p.m., the crew spotted an iceberg. The Titanic tried to avoid it, but the alarm had been sounded too late. Five minutes later, the two collided. The iceberg tore through the hull, and the once watertight compartments inside were badly ruptured. As the cold Atlantic water flooded in, the ship began to sink. Distress signals were sent, but the closest ship, the Carpathia, was over three hours away. In the dark of night and stuck in the middle of nowhere, the crew and passengers panicked. Those who could scrambled for the lifeboats. Others jumped into the icy waters. In total, only 706 survived that terrible night. Priest, at the time of the collision, was down in the ship's lower quarters. He was on break, relaxing from a hard day of work. And as the ship went down, so did his chances of survival. He and his fellow workers were in the most dangerous position on the ship. They had to make their way through a maze of corridors and gangways, some of which were flooded in a mad dash to the deck. And then they faced the frigid water, jumping in and desperately swimming to safety. The ocean was so cold that Priest even suffered frostbite before finding his way onto a lifeboat. He was one of only 44 stokers to survive that night. After an experience like that, most of us would never set foot on a boat again. But Priest had to work. His next job also ended in disaster. He was offered employment on the HMS Alcantara. It went down in 1916, and Priest was again one of the few to make it to safety. He was badly wounded in the process. But he kept pressing his luck, and his next job as a stoker may have felt eerily familiar. He would be working on a ship built by the same people behind both the Olympic and the Titanic. And this ship, named the Britannic, was the biggest of the three. It was also believed to be a superior vessel, fitted with new safety features after the Titanic sank. For example, it had 48 open lifeboats, 46 of which were the largest ever used on a ship before. Two of these were even motorized and equipped with special communication devices. The good news? The Britannic survived its first trip without incident. It was already doing better than the Titanic ever did. However, on November 21st, 1916, the Britannic was shaken by a loud explosion while traveling through the Key Channel in the Aegean Sea. The hull was damaged, and some of the compartments began to fill with water. But 
Unlike the Titanic, the Britannic had been designed for just such an emergency. It had been fitted with five watertight bulkheads. Intact, these would help keep the ship safe and floating for a much longer period of time. But there was one issue. Portholes along the lower decks had foolishly been left open. As the ship tilted, the portholes let in water, which flooded the Britannic and hastened its descent into the sea. This effectively made those watertight bulkheads useless. The ship was going down fast, much faster, in fact, than the Titanic had sunk. 35 of the lifeboats were successfully launched, saving most on board. Of the 1,066 passengers and crew, 1,036 survived. Priest, his luck intact, was one of them. And yet, he still wasn't done with a life at sea. He accepted a position as a stoker on the Donegal. It was a smaller passenger ferry that had been converted for use as a hospital boat. In April 1917, it was struck by a foreign object while fleeing an unsafe situation. And though he suffered from a head injury, Priest was again one of the survivors. It took experiencing two collisions and four sinkings before Priest was finally ready to retire. In fact, he reportedly said he only gave it up because no one wanted to sail with him. Can you blame them? He would live out the rest of his life on dry land in Southampton, England, with his wife, Annie, and their three sons. But Arthur John Priest would always be remembered as the unsinkable stoker. It was September 12, 1990. In those times, way before instant messaging and Zoom calls, a little girl was looking for pen pals. Zoe was aboard a ship from England to Belgium on vacation with her parents. She was only 10 years old at the time, but was a very clever schoolgirl. She took a piece of paper and started putting some words together. She introduced herself, Hello. then wrote about how she liked ballet and playing the flute and the piano. Of course, she couldn't help but mention her two adored pets, Aww. a little hamster she called Sparkle and her fish Speckle. She also put down the address at which she could be reached in case someone was interested in writing back to her. But alas, she was at sea. Oh. Who could she send this message to? Hmm. An interesting idea came to her mind. Hmm. She carefully placed her letter in a plastic bottle, tightly closed the lid to protect it from the water, and threw it into the sea. The little girl's excitement faded away over the years as she didn't receive a response. Maybe the bottle got stuck somewhere. Maybe it was swallowed by some big, scary sea creature. Or maybe the water actually poked through the plastic cap and destroyed her message. Many years later, on Christmas, a letter for Zoe was received at her parents' house under her maiden name. The postage signaled that the message was from Europe. It was from a Dutch couple, Pete and Jacqueline Lateau, who had found her delicate bottle and were very considerate to write back. They pointed out that they had found the letter among the debris thrown at the shore by the sea. Zoe's letter had been stranded for a staggering 23 years at sea and traveled for more than 350 miles to reach its final destination near Rotterdam in the Netherlands. That's quite a voyage for a small plastic bottle. A story similar to that of Zoe is the strange connection between two little boys. A little German boy named Frank Uzbek was on a boat traveling to Denmark when he got the same idea as Zoe. He was five years old at the time he put together a message and threw it into the unknown. The year was 1987. He got his response years later, when he was 29. His letter, just like the one Zoe would send a couple of years later, had been at sea for 24 years. His message was found by a boy named Daniel Karatkin while he was on a walk with his parents on the Koronian Spit near the Baltic Sea. Danielle was lucky that his father knew enough German to translate the message. The unlikely friends eventually met via video call in 2011. Not all message-in-a-bottle stories have been explained away. In 2013, a Croatian surfer came across a damaged bottle while near the Adriatic Sea. The message it contained dated back to 1985, and it was from a man named Jonathan. The sender was eager for his letter to reach a woman named Mary and he also expressed his keenness for her to respond. Since the letter was supposedly sent from Nova Scotia, the bottle had to have traveled a mind-boggling 3,700 miles. The message went from the Atlantic Ocean, entered the Mediterranean Sea, and reached the Adriatic shores in Croatia. The identities of neither John nor Mary were ever discovered. 
There are also messages in a bottle with wonderful love stories to share. This was the case for Ake and Paulina Wiking. When Ake, a lonely Swedish sailor, placed a letter in a bottle and threw it in the Mediterranean Sea, he had no idea the piece of paper would eventually reach his future wife. This was in the early 1950s. The bottle was found by an Italian man who was inspired enough to give it to his niece, Paulina. After a year of back-and-forth letters being exchanged, Aki and Paulina eventually met and got married. Having decided to share their story with the world, they became somewhat of a celebrity couple for the time. They even shared video footage of their wedding with the world, and their story was featured in a bunch of newspapers. This fortunate event started a movement between young people looking for love, increasing the number of messages being thrown out at sea in search of a fairy tale ending. Not all the stories that started out like this eventually worked out, though. In 1945, an American named Frank Heostack placed a similar message to that of Aki's in a bottle and threw it in the waters. Almost a year later, his letter was found by an Irish woman. Her name was Brenda O'Sullivan. Their years of correspondence soon caught the attention of the media at the time, but their friendship never flourished because of the added pressure. They eventually met in person when Frank traveled to Ireland, but he didn't stay for long, and they eventually got out of touch with each other. After Titanic met its strange ending, many bottles containing secret messages started to surface. Almost all of them proved to be counterfeited, apart from one letter. Years after Titanic had sunk in the icy Atlantic waters, a bottle was found on the Irish shores. It was supposedly from a man named Jeremiah Burke. And to this day, it is considered to be the only genuine message in a bottle originating from Titanic. The piece of paper simply stated the sender's name and the location, the Titanic, accompanied by the word goodbye. Since the date has washed away, it's difficult to estimate whether the note was sent before or after the ship had hit the iceberg. The common understanding is, however, that since Jeremiah was looking to relocate to the US, he was merely sending his last symbolic regards to his family and friends back in Ireland. This simple way of meeting and sometimes corresponding with people has turned into a hobby for a man from a Canadian province named Prince Edward Island, located east of the US state of Maine. This man, Harold Hackett, claims to have sent over 4,000 bottles into the Atlantic Ocean since 1996. He also claims to have received many responses from all over the world including letters from people in Europe, like France and Germany, but also from the Bahamas or even Africa. This unlikely pastime earns him about 150 Christmas cards from his pen pals each year. To this day, he refuses to add his phone number to any of his letters. This way, he ensures that if people ever want to contact him, the only means of doing so is via a written letter. He's also studied the best times to send the messages in the water based on the direction of the winds and the currents. Now, some bottles spend a whole lifetime at sea after being cast away by their sender. It was the case for a British man that wrote a message and placed it into a bottle before throwing it in the English Channel in 1914. His name was Thomas Hughes, and he wanted to direct the message to his wife, but was polite enough to write a letter to whoever got their hands on the bottle first, asking them to redirect the piece of paper accordingly. The bottle didn't reach his wife, since it was found 85 years later on the Essex coast. The man that stumbled upon the bottle was kind enough to reach out to the family and place the message in possession of Thomas's daughter. And 85 years isn't the longest time for a small bottle to be cruising the waves. A scientist named Hunter Brown was studying currents in the North Sea when this idea came to his mind. He placed the same message in almost 2,000 bottles and requested the unlikely recipient that they write back with the location of their discovery. He thought this method would help him better understand the layout of the North Sea currents. A bottle was found about 11 miles from its original departing location after 97 years. To this day, more than 300 of the original bottles relating to Hunter Brown's project eventually made it to the shore. Not all of the messages that were found in bottles got replied to via physical letters. 
Oliver Vandevala threw a bottle containing a letter on the English coast while he was on vacation with his family. He was 14 at the time. 33 years later, a woman reached out on Facebook claiming she had gotten his message and tracked him down through his social media profile. Hmm. At first, he hardly remembered having placed the letter in the bottle. But he eventually recounted the events, <laughs> even the fact that he sealed the bottle with candle wax to make sure it was leak-proof. And then there's Christina Aguilera and her bottle. No, wait, hers is about a genie in a bottle. Okay, never mind. It was the biggest ship ever built in its time, and it was supposed to be unsinkable. But within days of steaming out on its first voyage in 1912, the Titanic was gone beneath the relentless waves of the North Atlantic Ocean. And of its more than 2,200 passengers and crew, only 706 survived that dreadful night. Would a smaller ship have fared any better in the same situation? Did the size of the iceberg truly matter in the end? Was it a mistake for the ship to change course at the last minute as it tried to avoid impact? These are three questions that have people pondering, what if? We do know that Titanic was considered an engineering marvel in its day. Designed by Thomas Andrews for the British shipping company White Star Line, it was just over 880 feet long and 175 feet tall. Built with abundant space for 840 staterooms, a swimming pool, a squash court, a gym, and two dining rooms. But it was below deck that one of its most impressive new features could be found. Titanic's hull was divided into 16 compartments designed to be watertight. Up to four of these compartments could take on water in the event of a breach, with the remaining 12 helping to keep the damaged ship afloat. It was thanks to these compartments that the ship was regarded as unsinkable. Rumor has it that Philip Frank, White Star Line's vice president, even declared, There is no danger that Titanic will sink. The boat is unsinkable, and nothing but inconvenience will be suffered by the passengers. On April 14, 1912, that proved to be mistaken when Titanic struck an iceberg, as ice ripped along the ship's hull. Several of those watertight compartments ruptured. It took only two and a half hours for Titanic to sink. Did the size of the iceberg that hit Titanic seal its fate? Would a bigger or smaller iceberg have made any difference? Icebergs come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. They are pieces of ice that have broken away from glaciers or ice shelves in the Arctic and Antarctic and are now wandering across the ocean until they eventually melt. One of the tallest icebergs ever found would have easily dwarfed Titanic. Discovered in 1957, it was 550 feet high. That's close to the height of the Washington Monument. Imagine ramming into something that big. Smaller icebergs, though, can turn out just as dangerous. Some are the size of houses and called bergy bits. Others, closer to the size of a car, are called growlers. These can be much harder for ships and boats to locate, making them more difficult to avoid. And, though smaller, they can produce a lot of damage when hit. It's also critical to recall that icebergs are always bigger than they seem, with the majority of their mass lurking below the ocean surface. In fact, over 80% of an iceberg's volume is underwater. Most of its sharp, jagged edges cannot be seen. Roam too close, and you risk damaging your ship's hull. Because Titanic had little notice of its impending doom, a smaller iceberg, struck at the same angle, could still have been enough to bring that mighty ship down. Now, it's possible that had the iceberg been larger, it would have been spotted sooner. Titanic might have had time to alter course and avoid the impact. But missing that one iceberg would not have guaranteed Titanic safety. It was traveling in a dangerous stretch of the Atlantic called Iceberg Alley. It's located 250 miles east and southeast of Newfoundland, Canada. Behind one iceberg, there could be another. And another after that. And so the crew on board had to remain very attentive to avoid several potential collisions, not just one. A smaller ship might have been better suited for the trip. Titanic's size was certainly a challenge when it came to steering. 
In fact, it had just left her dock in Southampton when it nearly collided with another smaller ocean liner, the SS New York, missing it by just two feet. The gigantic steamship was obviously not made for maneuvering quickly in tight quarters. A ship that size required time and space to change course. But when it comes to ships versus icebergs, a ship's size doesn't always matter. The Islander was a steamship designed to travel the inside passage in Alaska. In the summer of 1901, it struck an iceberg, which tore a hole in the front portion or bow of the ship. The vessel did not sink right away, and the crew tried to steer it to safety. Ultimately, its bow completely submerged, and its stern was lifted up and out of the water. It didn't take much longer before the ship sank completely. Of the 168 passengers and crew members, 128 survived, and $3 million in gold was lost. Islander had a 240-foot hull, making it almost a quarter of the size of Titanic. And that smaller size didn't seem to be much help in preventing a collision with an iceberg. And then there was the Hans Hedtoff in 1959. Also known as the Little Titanic or the Danish Titanic, it was referred to as the safest ship afloat. It was 272 feet long, with 95 people on board. Much like the real Titanic, the Hans Hedtoff was specifically engineered to handle most of what the sea could throw its way. Along with its double steel bottom, it also had an armored bow and seven watertight compartments. How could such a ship sink? But it could, and it did. It was on its first voyage, returning to Copenhagen, when it ran into trouble. On January 30th, it hit an iceberg. An SOS was sent, but when the Johannes Cross arrived to help, the Hans Hedtoff was nowhere to be found. The only evidence of the ship's existence was a life belt that was washed ashore in Iceland nine months later. Again, the ship's smaller size didn't work in its favor. A smaller size of Titanic wouldn't have guaranteed a safe voyage in 1912. The final what-if concerns the last-minute choice when the iceberg was spotted and the alarm sounded. First, Titanic could attempt a complete stop. But this wasn't an option, as the ship needed a half a mile to come to a halt, and the iceberg was a mere 900 feet away. Second, the Titanic could attempt to avoid the iceberg by steering away from it. This is what the captain ordered, but the attempt was unsuccessful, resulting in a deep gash across the ship's hull. The final option? To hit the iceberg head-on. Would this have made any difference? The answer is an intriguing maybe. Some think a head-on collision would have saved Titanic. In this scenario, the collision would have limited the damage to the very front of the ship. Instead of the iceberg tearing through the hull and compromising several of the watertight compartments, only four of the compartments would have been breached. This meant the others could do their job of keeping Titanic afloat. The ship could be stuck, unable to move, but it would remain above water until help arrived. This would provide a ship like Carpathia enough time to reach the scene of the accident and bring the people on board to safety. One of the Titanic's designers, Edward Wilding, made a similar claim during an inquiry into the sinking. He argued that most people would have survived a head-on crash, and that Titanic itself would not have sunk. Others disagree, though. First, the special bulkheads on Titanic were designed specifically to protect the ship against collisions with other vessels, not with icebergs. These compartments would crumple upon impact, absorbing some of the force while the other ship absorbed the rest. Though the damage would still be extensive, the remaining bulkheads would keep the ship afloat. But an iceberg does not have the same flex in a collision as you would experience with another ship. Most of the force would be absorbed by Titanic, resulting in greater damage to the ship. Even worse, the impact would be carried through the full length of the ship. Rivets would burst, seams would tear, the compartments would quickly flood, and the ship would sink even faster, resulting in fewer survivors. In any case, as with most what-ifs, we'll never really know the answer. As tragic as Titanic's first and last voyage was, it did result in changes that helped make venturing out to sea much safer. 
Findings from hearings on the disaster led to the creation of the International Ice Patrol, or ICC, in 1914, an organization that tracks icebergs in the Atlantic and Arctic Oceans to ensure vessels in the area can avoid them. In the US and Britain, ships were obligated to carry enough lifeboats to accommodate every person aboard. Regular lifeboat drills were made mandatory. And finally, the bulkheads on ships were made higher to keep water out, and bottoms were stretched to create double hulls, helping make the compartments truly waterproof. There's no denying that Titanic was a terrible tragedy. But the lessons learned from that night to remember has helped prevent many more. Can you guess how many theories of the Titanic sinking exist? Right, loads! including a theory of my own, which I'm going to share with you today. And then you can decide which one seems most likely to you. One Piece Theory The very first version of the events was the One Piece Theory. It's very simple and basically claims that the sinking happened without any breakups. 2.15 a.m. The ship collides with an iceberg. 2.18 a.m. The lights go out. The ship reaches an angle of 45 degrees and then quickly begins its final plunge into the ocean depths. 2.20 a.m. Only about three minutes later, the RMS Titanic disappears under the surface of the ocean for good. The liner doesn't break. It just goes down as a whole piece. Of course, this can't be true. In April 1912, the Titanic was not only the largest ship in the world, but also the largest ship ever built. It's hard to believe that such a heavy vessel could have gone down without breaking. That's just impossible. Well, I mean, you can't blame the theorists. Before we found the wreckage, there were no other theories. Wait a minute, or were there? The day after the disaster, the survivors gave their interviews. They talked about what had happened, and some of them claimed that the ship had actually broken in two when it had been flooded. For example, Jack Thayer, a 17-year-old boy, outlined the sinking as he remembered it. And L.D. Skidmon drew a sketch based on his description. The picture clearly showed the ship breaking in half. But no one believed Jack or other witnesses. There was no evidence, so their claims were received with a grain of salt. But in 1985, things changed. First Breakup Theory That's when Robert Ballard found the wreckage of the Titanic in the depths of the ocean. When people saw the wreckage, it became clear that Jack and the other survivors had been right. The Titanic did indeed break in two when it sank. So it's time for a new theory. 2.15 a.m. The keel breaks, the starboard list eases, and the hull continues to bow and crumble. 2.17 a.m. The galley sections break off, The towers immediately drop under their own weight. The lights go out. The stern is pulled into the air. The bow breaks off and starts sinking. The aft is barely hanging on to the starboard side of the stern section superstructure. The stern section slowly lists over to port as it begins sinking again. It rises up one last time and pivots in a semicircle as it sinks. It all sounds pretty convincing, right? But people began to find plot holes in this theory. For example, the Titanic couldn't have held together until it reached such a high angle. The breakup would have had to begin much earlier. This only meant there was still a vast field for research and speculations. So people started to come up with their own possible scenarios. How about we look first at the ones no one likes? V-Break and Aaron 1912 V-Break. According to the first breakup theory, the Titanic reached a high angle, and the weight of its unsupported stern caused it to crack from the top down. But it's physically impossible. So are there any other ideas? In 2006, Roger Long, a naval architect, decided to research a so-called V theory. 2.17 a.m. The breakup begins at a shallow angle, perhaps as little as 11 degrees. The upper structure fails and starts to crack. At this moment, only its double bottom is holding the Titanic together, but it starts to bend under the strain too, failing the ship. Water is pouring through the crack. It increases the weight in between the two sections, bending the Titanic the other way 
and pulling it into shape somewhat resemblant to the letter B. The upper decks get mangled and bent together. The bow heads for the bottom, and the stern is the last to sink. This theory has since been disproven many times, though. Roger Long believed it because the broken edges of the upper decks in the Titanic's bow section were all mangled and crushed. However, we have learned that it happened because of the so-called hydraulic downburst, the force of the water crashing into the deck as the Titanic hit the ocean floor. Another V-brake theory states that the bow had risen out of the water after the break. This theory was mainly peddled by one former Titanic enthusiast. But not only has this theory been proved to be physically impossible due to the bow's incredible mass, it was also inspired by incorrect information. Remember Jack Thayer? Well, it was based on his sketch and the words of a couple of passengers. But the truth is, none of them had ever seen the Titanic break down like this. Jack himself even stated in an interview that the sketch was completely out of context to what he had actually seen. It was drawn by a passenger on the Carpathia, the ship that received the Titanic's distress signal and came to its aid. It couldn't be used as evidence. Now that we know this, let's move on to the theories that most people believe in. James Cameron's Banana Peel Theory. Who hasn't seen the legendary movie about the Titanic, right? It became the leader of the 70th Academy Awards ceremony in the number of nominations and awards, and deservedly so. But did you know that James Cameron had been interested in the Titanic for many years and studied the ship's history? His books and research are very detailed, and he even came up with his own version of the events. It's called the Banana Split Theory, and this is actually what you could see in the movie. Here's how it goes. The Titanic reaches a 23 degree angle and fractures down to the keel. The double bottom acts as a hinge as the stern falls down. When the double bottom fails, the bow and the stern separate. The stern lists to port, standing vertically, and then begins to go underwater. This theory is the most scientifically accurate one, along with Roy Mengott's theory. Wait, who's Roy Mengott? Mengott theory. Roy Mengott was an engineer who came up with the most plausible theory for the time being. 2.17 a.m. The lights go out on the Titanic. At this moment, the ship is at an angle of 20 to 23 degrees. Suddenly, the vessel snaps in two just around the third funnel. It causes the stern to settle into the water. The keel fails first. The draft and lower hull are crushed and break apart. Water surges into the bow and stern of the ship through the huge cracks, causing the bow section to sink beneath the waves. The stern rises up to the angle of 70 to 90 degrees, and then it sinks too. This theory seems to make the most sense, but it's quite controversial. The survivors who saw the breakup stated that the stern had settled back with the bow completely missing. Mengott's theory, however, contradicts that statement, while James Cameron's scenario takes this into account. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? The truth must be somewhere in the middle. My version. Now, as promised, I'll provide you with my version of the events. Well, it's not really my theory. More like a combination of Roy Mengott's and James Cameron's ones. I believe that James Cameron was right about the breakup. 2.17 a.m. The ship is at a high angle. The lights go out. Then it snaps into two pieces. The bow starts sinking. The double bottom is still attached to the stern for a minute or so. Once the double bottom fails, the two parts separate and the bow goes down. Then, as Mengot said, the stern rises up at a high angle, and then it begins to sink vertically. It might have actually happened because the survivors stated that they had seen a clean break. This means it couldn't be hidden. And they had also seen the stern staying vertically in the air for a long enough time, probably a few minutes before disappearing. Anyways, all of these are just speculations. Regardless of how the Titanic broke apart and sank, it was a great tragedy. It's already been 110 years since the Titanic collided with an iceberg and sank. Did you know that in 2022, 
the Blue Star Line Company is completing the construction of an exact replica of the Titanic. Called the Titanic II Liner, the ship will be sent sailing along the same route with 2,400 people on board. Let's hope that everything goes well for them.